Hello everyone, uh, I am Rodrigo Guerrero. I am the social media leader from the World Stroke Academy. And I welcome all, all of you to this question and answer session that um, where we will be uh, discussing the new Boston Criteria, Boston Criteria 2.0, with uh, one of their authors, uh, Dr. Andreas Sharimu. Andreas is a neurologist from the uh, Boston Medical Center and uh, we have been learning a lot from him in the last month about uh, cerebral amyloid antibody. So uh, thank you very much uh, for accept our invitation, Andreas. It's um, um, a privilege to be here with you. Thank you so much, Rodrigo. It's, a, it's really a great pleasure to be able to participate in this Q&A, which I think it's, it's very important to uh, address some of the many questions we received on uh, social media and we'll be discussing things in a more uh, like a uh, direct way uh, around the criteria that we probably didn't have the chance to cover uh, in the paper uh, about the practical applicability and all different aspects. So I'm very happy uh, for the invitation and that we're doing this Q&A. Great, great. As most of you uh, know, CAA, is uh, the primary cause of uh, lower hemorrhage, but it uh, plays a key role on um, uh, cognitive impairment too. So we have to, uh, two ways to um, enter in CAA, uh, at least in a practical way. So um, this uh, Q&A session has been prepared uh, with your questions that we collect on Twitter. Um, a few others that we have been uh, we have prepared to um, make today and uh, discuss with Andreas. So let's go with the first one uh, that it's maybe a kind of resume. Andreas, tell us please what are the main changes or the new features that um, have this this criteria from the previous one? Yeah, so. Basically, the, the last, the latest, the last version of the Boston criteria uh, were published in 2010, and those were referred to as the modified Boston criteria, which they followed from the original publication of the Boston criteria, which was in the, uh, in the middle, uh, mid 90s. And um, the notable changes in, uh, uh, in the current version of the criteria, which we named Boston criteria version two, include a number of clinical and MRI modifications. Um, just to say that the basic structure of the, of the criteria remained the same in that the categories of in vivo diagnosis of CA is still probable and possible CA. Now, what has changed is that the age cutoff has been lowered to 50, to 50 years and older from 55 years that was in the previous version. Also a notable change is that um, in order to apply the Boston criteria, a requirement is that any given patient presents with a potential CA related syndrome, which includes one of the three, either spontaneous, intracerebral hemorrhage, transient focal neurological episodes, or as you said, cognitive impairment or dementia. Uh, now, from the clinical uh, MRI-based uh, uh, biomarker side of things, uh, in the new criteria, the cortical superficial siderosis and convexity subarachnoid hemorrhage, they have a more central role in that in the previous criteria, the presence of siderosis of any severity would count as one hemorrhagic lesion, whereas now, uh, the multiplicity, so having different foci of siderosis counts as separate hemorrhagic les lesions. So in practice, you can diagnose a patient as having probable CAA just based on siderosis only, as long as this is uh, in at least two uh, separate foci. The other big change is that now we have included non-hemorrhagic lesions uh, in the criteria and these are basically um, uh, white matter spots in a pattern that includes more than 10 of these spots in the centrum semiovale, and also severe um, 
centrum cerebral perivascular spaces um, um, uh, as part of these non-hemorrhagic markers. So essentially, uh, you can we have no white in the criteria, and you can have um, a single hemorrhagic marker and one of the white matter markers and still be diagnosed as probable CAA. The same applies for the possible CA category, whereas you can have a single hemorrhagic lesion or one white matter lesion and still um, be included in these diagnostic categories. The other small change is that in the previous version of the criteria, in one of the footnotes, INR uh, more than um, uh, four, if I remember well, was one of the exclusion criteria. And the mm -hmm. idea was that if you have an anticoagulation related hemorrhage with a high INR, uh, you shouldn't be diagnosed this as CA related. But as we know more about uh, anticoagulation related bleeds, there is possibly a contribution for small vessel disease. Plus, we have the switch to uh, yeah. uh, DOACs. So INR is no longer, uh, does no longer appear as an exclusion in the current criteria. So these, these I believe, are the big changes. Clinical, MRI, and some exclusions. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's very practical because um, we were used to be really focused on the hemorrhagic uh, um, uh, features. And maybe the non-hemorrhagic, like the white matter hyperintensities, were overlooked, and we we didn't rely uh, too much on uh, on that features to make any any diagnosis. With okay, this is a seventy or or older patient, he, he has to have this white matter okay, hyperintensities. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it, it's 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 really. Um, uh, practical. The, the yeah. And, and basically, uh, what we have learned about the white matter lesions is that even on clinical MRIs, you can look for a pattern. So, their white matter fiber intensities, they come in different forms and different patterns. They yeah. can be anterior, posterior, you have the spots, you have the peribasal ganglia. So, yeah. yeah, different flavors that you can really easily rate. In your in the hospital, any clinician yeah. around the world. So yes, is, uh, I'm glad we uh, ended up including this and mm -hmm. proved that they have a value. One of the first question that came uh, came up when we were starting this this Q and A session mm -hmm. was that, as you said, you have to uh, have a clinical syndrome first, um, but uh, people are, uh, ask. What about asymptomatic patients? What about people with no obvious cognitive impairment, impairment no TFNEs, uh, nor uh, hemorrhagic lesions? What, what, yeah. what about that patient? Yeah, the that, that was, uh, asked a lot about that. Yeah, yeah. It was probably the most uh, asked question whether you can apply the criteria in a patient who gets an MRI for a headache or, you know, incidentally, you see any of these markers. So. I think there are two answers. First of all, from a methodological point of view, since the population we included to come up with the criteria and validate the, the criteria were hospital-based populations that came with one of these syndromes, yeah. it really is not fair just based on our paper to expand them to any healthy asymptomatic individual, because in reality, in our paper, we don't present any data of the diagnostic accuracy of these criteria in asymptomatic uh, populations. Now, uh, there, is the, uh, there is a paper that came up a few years ago that looked at the previous version of the criteria in the Framingham Heart Study patients that had both an MRI and pathology. And they showed that uh, the diagnostic accuracy of this criteria in this population is not very good. So uh, the, uh, the specificity uh, was very low. Uh, so by including uh, a clinical syndrome, you, uh, by definition, you basically uh, increase the pretest probability because That's these funny. are likely the patients who have severe CA to be manifested as such. Yeah. Uh, and, in a, and 
Excuse me, a, a, a related one uh, of the question was, um, so, so where does the disease begin? Uh, it's like the diabetes, you know that diabetes, they have the, the, the pathophysiology 10, 15 years um, before you get the, the a hyperglycemic diagnos diagnosis. Yeah. So is there a threshold? Uh, what, what do you think? I think this is a, it is like the million dollar question. It's a tough yeah. question. <laughs> because if you know uh, where, when the disease starts, you can basically make a diagnosis of early CAA in, which gives you a window to intervene and prevent the bleeding from happening, which would be amazing. Uh, so the truth is, we don't really know. As you said, it's a very chronic vascular degenerative condition. But the reality is that many of the healthy elder, uh, elderly that have CAA, they never become symptomatic. Um, uh, which we know this from neuropathological uh, autopsy studies, that uh, as you grow older, inevitably you develop some degree of uh, uh, CA or amyloid accumulation, but it is not a disease at that point. It's a neuropathological trait. Uh, now, I believe there are other um, triggers and risk factors, including genetics. So having a, an APOE epsilon 4 or epsilon uh, 2, uh, having uncontrolled hypertension that might work synergistically uh, with uh, just having uh, amyloid accumulation to bring up more bleeding. Uh, it's also possible that there are different phenotypes of CAA. So you might have a CAA that is uh, only mild and affects only the intracortical vessels, or you might have a very aggressive form of CAA in some patients because of a different number of, reg of, re of reasons affecting more the leptomeningeal vessels, leading to uh, vasculopathic changes, so vessel cracking, um, and hence more bleeding. Uh, but what we know is that the progressive accumulation of amyloid, probably in combination with other factors, triggers these events. Yeah. And having said that, by definition, the criteria, they include these structural MRI markers, which are late features of the disease because we're not looking at the vessel, we're looking at the effect on the brain parenchyma. Yeah. However, we have studies, including a, a very nicely phenotyped cohorts of Dutch CA patients, so hereditary CA, that they show that in pre-symptomatic uh, carriers, you have physiological changes. So changes in vascular reactivity, changes in uh, amyloid head uptake. Uh, so there are many changes within the brains and the vessels of the patients that might end up having significant CAA. But right now, we don't know which of those patients are going to maybe, develop the syndrome. Maybe we will read about the, the, the fast and slow progressors with CAA in the next yeah. year. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a probability. Um, or the bleeders and the non-bleeders. Yeah. They're also, so, huh? even within the patients that develop, let's say, a low bar intraparenchymal hemorrhage, there are those patients that they develop a hemorrhage and they, they recover fairly well and they never have another bleeding event versus there are patients that they have a lower hemorrhage and in three months they have another one, in six months another one. Yeah. So that's why I'm saying there are probably different phenotypes. It's not a uniform disease. Yeah. So the the um, the criteria, as you said, has the the same uh, structure, definitive. You you put this uh, probably CAA with supporting pathology. Uh, the probable, that's is the main group, isn't it? And uh, yeah. possible. So one of the questions was uh, if if was tough given the broadening of the clinical criteria for possible CAA, um, like including, um, it, 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 the question was, uh, 
about the asymptomatic patients uh, being being including it in this um, possible uh, uh, criteria. This was yeah. a group of criteria. Yeah. Uh, um, but so do you think that's going to be a practical uh, issue? Uh, I mean, the, if, if we think about that, by including asymptomatic individuals in possible category, even we have, even when they have like a, one of the uh, five MRI markers, let's say single lower microlid or severe CSO PVS, I I'm afraid we will end up including a lot of patients, a lot of, sorry, a lot of uh, people uh, in which CA might never be a problem might never lead to any symptom. In other words, we might increase the sensitivity of the criteria in that we're gonna include inevitably some people that uh, they have true significant CA, but we're gonna include a lot more that they don't have it. Yeah. Because these markers are not perfect. And, and I'm wondering wh whether the clinical implications of uh, applying the CA label would be beneficial or not. For example, you wouldn't want a patient who is labeled as CAA be uh, uh, stopped from taking anticoagulation for AFib with the assumption that the bleeding risk is high. Um, now, what we're doing as a follow-up of, uh, of this publication is that we're actually actively looking on the performance of this criteria in a, a population-based sample. So participants in studies that they had both an MRI and autopsy, but never had a bleed or any other symptoms to see what's their diagnostic performance. And maybe as a step further in the future, maybe if we want to include this pay, these participants to trials, we might need to come up with a different set of criteria for asymptomatic individuals. Yeah. Um, so Andrea, let's go, let's go back to basic. Uh, when you have this patient with an hemorrhagic lesion, lower hemorrhagic lesion, and you think, okay, this could be CAA. Um, uh, the, the first question should be, okay, but what are other common causes of uh, etiology of this hemorrhagic lesion that I should look for and rule out uh, before I label this patient? At as uh, having CAA. Yeah. yeah, this is another important question because we have it in the criteria that any other cause or contributing factor of a lower hemorrhage, siderosis, subarachnoid hemorrhage needs to be ruled out. So essentially, uh, you have to think of the differential diagnosis of any lower hemorrhage, which includes um, vascular malformations, uh, 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 it can include uh, RCVS, hemorrhagic transformation of an ischemic stroke uh, uh, to basically rule out secondary causes of um, hemorrhage. And then becomes the question, if there is no underlying cause after a thorough evaluation, is it hypertensive arteriopathy? Is it CAA? Is it both? So you have to think through your, your differential as you would do for any hemorrhage, really. And the mm -hmm. same applies for um, cortical superficial siderosis and um, convexal subarachnoid hemorrhage the, and microbleeds, in fact. So there is a long list of other causes that uh, can lead to these hemorrhagic imaging features. Traumatic brain injury, for example, can cause microbleeds in a lower distribution. Any sort of cardiac surgery, valve replacement, has been associated in studies with uh, um, microbleeds. Um, so, I mean, similar for siderosis and subarachnoid hemorrhage. Like, there is a huge list of, of causes that you need to thoroughly work up the patient for. Okay. Uh, um, keeping on the on the hemorrhagic lesion, there in a, in the probably and possible uh, CAA, um, the criteria said that that should be an um, absence of any deep hemorrhagic lesion. But what about this patient that have a uh, uh, lower hemorrhage? You, uh, you see uh, cortical superficial siderosis and have two, three, four, five, six microbleeds yeah. on basal ganglia. Yeah. 
what, which what is a, a, it's a very common scenario, right? Yeah. It's more common in, in, in clinical practice to see patients with mixed hemorrhages than see pure uh, lower or pure deep. Um, so, so the truth is, despite having assembled a huge cohort for a pathological study, uh, we didn't have enough power to suggest criteria that would include the mixed cases. That's why we kept it uh, pure in a way. Yeah, okay. uh, and that's why the criteria look a bit rigid. Uh, we're now actively looking on a small cohort uh, that had mixed hemorrhages to characterize what was the underlying pathology. And what I can share with you is that, uh, which we know from, from the literature, is that siderosis is probably the most specific feature of CAA. Essentially, hypertensive arteriopathy, for what, whatever reason, rarely, if ever, causes siderosis. And we know this from Cadacil uh, cohorts, from uh, uh, hypertensive arteriopathy, deep hemorrhages cohorts. So. In my practice, when I see a patient who presents with a hematoma, lower hematoma, has siderosis and has a couple of deep microbleeds, I would still diagnose this as uh, potentially CAA, despite not fulfilling the criteria. Because the criteria, the way I'm thinking about them, is that they give us a framework on how to approach diagnosis of CAA using MRIs and clinical presentation. But then you, uh, elderly individuals have both CA probably and hypertension, vascular risk factors. So they might have both. So in clinical practice, as it applies to many conditions, you need to be a bit more open-minded and yeah. uh, uh, look at different things. But those are the patients that uh, uh, we should, shouldn't give uh, antiplatelets if they um, are prescribed for any other issue? The, the, oh, those patients mean, with, with cortical uh, superficial cirrhosis. So the, the, the truth is we don't know. We don't have good quality randomized data to guide us on what's the risk and benefit of anticoagulation, uh, antithrombotics. What we do know from pure CA cohorts based on MRI is that disseminated cirrhosis, so having cirrhosis in three fossa or more is the uh, uh, the most risk the riskier uh, factor driving uh, future hemorrhage, but how that changes our our risk and benefit uh, in terms of hemorrhage versus ischemic stroke is not very well known. I mean there are ongoing trials now looking at this question from different centers. So hopefully in the future we're going to have better answers um, okay. about that. Uh, Andreas, let's move on uh, to the, uh, another um, non-hemorrhagic features. That's the the white matter hyperintensity in a multi-spot pattern. Uh, and, and people um, ask, what about uh, the large confluent posterior periventricular white matter hyperintensity that we used to see uh, in these in, in these patients? So this this um, periventricular uh, uh, atrium related uh, um, white matter hyperintensity should be called as one that maybe you know that the, the, maybe it's not just one that it's a, a, a confluent uh, white matter hyperintensity. So, so you're asking about the posterior distribution of uh, white matter hyperintensities but, or? Yeah, the, the, the question was the, um, what about what about large confluent posterior preventricular white matter hyper hyperintensity mm. in the criteria? Okay, I see, I see. So basically, it's, yeah, it's coming from the um, um, pathological data showing that amyloid angiopathy affects a lot posterior uh, cortical areas, like the occipital lobe, uh, uh, the parietal lobe. Um, so there have been a few studies looking at posterior distribution of uh, white matter fiber intensities as a marker of CAA. And there are two ways to approach that. There is visual inspection. So you uh, uh, review visually the flare and you decide if it looks to you more posterior than anterior. And there are some visual rating scales. Uh, 
And then there are more quantitative methods to look at that. And a couple of studies that they use a quantitative method to measure that, they found that a more posterior distribution is associated with uh, CA compared to other pathologies. Um, however, the visual inspection to decide if it's more anterior than posterior in a patient that has uh, uh, periventricular white matter fiber intensities, I'm not sure how accurate it is. Like with the naked eye, we're missing a lot of that information. We did look at that um, in our um, discovery cohort. We rated posterior white matter fiber intensities, but it, it wasn't really associated with uh, independently with um, uh, with CAing or pathologically. So it's one of the markers that if you see it in combination with uh, other features of CA, it might be suggestive, but it's not let's say it's not good enough, it's not sensitive nor specific enough to be included in any formal way into the criteria, just because its rating by visual inspection is very inaccurate. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, this is, a, this is a good one, practical one. Um, the criteria say that in the, in the clinical presentation, you can have the MRAT, uh, the transient uh, focal neurological episodes and cognitive impairment or dementia. So um, a neurologist asks uh, if the cognitive impairment or dementia should have any specific uh, feature, you know, if it's more amnesic or disexecutive. Um, what, 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 what? Yeah. It's, it's a big umbrella of dementia here. Is any presentation or more, more behavioral? Yeah, I see. Yeah, no, that, that's a very fair point. It's a point that actually came up a lot uh, during the review of the paper uh, in Lancet Neurology. The truth is um, we never had data on this cohort to, to characterize the pattern of cognitive impairment or dementia that these patients had. Uh, you would imagine that um, patients with CAA, um, if they have dementia, they will present either as an Alzheimer's type uh, syndrome because CAA goes hands in hands with uh, um, Alzheimer type pathology, or if it's um, if it's a dementia that develop after a, a lower hemorrhage, it will be more of a vascular disexecutive syndrome. So we haven't specified in the criteria that a certain pattern of cognitive domains uh, should be affected or not. Uh, so it's basically open to interpretation. Any patient with a cognitive impairment uh, uh, can, be, um, in, can be potentially uh, get an MRI as happens in memory clinic and you can apply the criteria. Um, mm -hmm. Although the prevalence of CA is different in different syndromes, so a patient with Lewy body dementia likely ha has less CA compared with a patient with a more pure mm -hmm. Alzheimer's Alzheimer pathology. pathology. Yeah. So it's it, basically the pattern of cognitive impairment, I imagine, changes your pretest probability. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's... Uh, um... The, the main feature, isn't it, the, from this criteria, all, all the the, the um, imaging characteristic uh, or new features. So, uh, regarding that, some people have uh, have asked, what about the mar the view markers? What about PET? What what? Why uh, they are not on the criteria? What's not amyloid PET or CSF markers? Yeah, diagnosis of CAA. Yeah, I, I, again, we can approach the answer from two different uh, perspectives. The first one from a methodological and practical point of view, if we insist of having as the uh, diagnostic reference like gold standard to be neuropathology, it's hard to assemble these cohorts of having both CSF, PET, MRI, and neuropathology like to have a large enough cohort to look at the actual diagnostic performance of uh, non-MRI markers is, 
it's very challenging. Uh, so that, that's like the short answer. Now, when it comes to, uh, let's say pets, amyloid pet, we know that the, the currently available amyloid pet lichens, they label both vascular amyloid and parenchymal amyloid. So we don't have a vascular amyloid specific lichen to allow us uh, uh, to validate and use in, uh, in routine clinical practice. Uh, so what we know about amyloid PET is that if it's positive, it can be due to CAA, Alzheimer's disease, or both in any combination. So the positive test doesn't necessarily help us. We do know, however, that if the amyloid PET is negative, with high degree of certainty, you can say that this patient likely does not have CAA. But that's the only thing you can basically say. It's useful to rule out. Right. It's a useful to rule out, yes. Um, for CSF markers, I think CSF markers are, are very promising. Uh, the problem is that we don't have any specific cutoffs on how to use them. But I see that, that in the future, probably CSF and PET biomarkers could be very complementary to the Boston criteria. Uh, you can use them in clinical practice in cases that they don't quite fulfill the criteria, but you still have a high clinical suspicion. Uh, mm -hmm. One potential option is to get either CSF or an amyloid PET and um, go from there. Uh, also, in the future, if they're validated, there would be ideal preclinical markers of CAA in, pa in patients that they haven't yet developed the MRI manifestations. So just to conclude in, in uh, answering this question is that we don't have enough data yet on how to integrate these markers into a form of uh, formal criteria for diagnosis. So if we were to do that, it would be with limited observational data and it will be more of a guess game. But I believe they do have a practical role that it might emerge in the future in cases that do not quite fulfill the criteria. So we need, mm -hmm. we basically need uh, uh, big studies looking at the amyloid PET and CSF and how, how they can be mapped into the disease trajectory, what we're discussing at the beginning uh, yeah. about the course of CAA. Yeah. Um, maybe the, the, the answer would be uh, similar. Uh, what about the cerebellar lesions? Yeah, the, yeah, the, there is like an in, emerging interest in, in cerebellum uh, yeah. <laughs> and small vessel disease. And uh, there have been a couple of very interesting studies uh, from, uh, one was from uh, Marco Passi when he was at Mass General and one from Taiwan, from Cynthia Tsai, uh, who they showed similar to um, the brain, the cerebrum, uh, the distribution of microbleeds give us information on the underlying arteriopathy. Yeah. Uh, so if you have lower microbleeds, they're more likely due to CAA. If you have deep microbleeds, they're more likely due to hypertensive arteriopathy. It seems that the same is true in the cerebellum. Cerebellar cortical microbleeds are more likely related to CAA, whereas deep microbleeds in the cerebellar nuclei are more related to hypertensive arteriopathy. Now, the problem is um, that by the time the cerebellum is involved in CAA, you already had involvement of the cerebral oh, yeah. cortex. So we actually look at this in our paper in that we rated the distribution of cerebellar microbleeds, but those patients already fulfill the bottom criterion because of uh, lesions above. It would be a late presentation. Exactly. Late so they, yeah. So they never, in, in our cohort at least, assessing and taking into account cerebellar microbleeds did not lead to any reclassification of patients based on the Boston criteria. Um, so so most, of the, most of the patient with uh, any hemorrhagic lesion on cerebellum, they uh, already have uh, features, uh, two gradentorial features that are, yeah. are already given a, a diagnosis of CAA. 
Yeah. Isn't it? Right? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the main. Uh, uh, there, there is a ceiling effect, effectively. Yeah. Yeah. So we 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 talk about amyloid CSF, but that uh, it's not worldwide available. But MRI isn't either. Uh, not not every. Um, uh, low medium income countries have MRA in, in every hospital. So uh, a lot of, um, of people from the, the, uh, those countries uh, ask, uh, what do you think uh, about the, the, the future of using uh, CT-based criteria? Uh, we have seen, uh, we, we learn about uh, the Edinburgh uh, criteria from uh, uh, MRAT, uh, CAA related M uh, MRAT. What, what do you think? Do you, uh, do you think that uh, we will you have a, a, a space, uh, the, the CT? Yeah, the, uh, again, uh, looking at the recent literature in stroke, we seem to be going back to the future using, yeah. <laughs> with a focus of systematically looking at the CTs, even for patients with uh, dementia, right? Whether certain CT features can help us predict the risk of dementia. So um, I think there is, uh, as you said, MRI is not readily available in, uh, in many parts of the world. Um, so I think CT criteria, they do have a role. Uh, now the um, Edinburgh criteria open up the exciting possibility of actually diagnosing CAA in patients without an MRI. But this, um, uh, this criteria only apply for patients that present with lobar hemorrhage. Right. Yeah. Uh, so by definition, they only capture one aspect of the CA spectrum. Yeah. Uh, and there are two main features is basically the uh, convex uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage extension of the yeah. hematoma and the finger-like projections. Finger -like projections. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what we're learning as there are more papers getting published looking at the Edinburgh criteria is that these two features are more likely to be present in patients with larger hematomas. For, for whatever reason, there are different pathophysiological ways that this can be explained. So it means they might be good markers uh, in, in patients with lower hemorrhages when the hematoma is big enough. But when the hematoma is small, in the absence of these features, you're not sure if that patient has CA or so not. So it's, it's, more, it's more related to the volume than, than the, to the uh, pathophysiology. Uh, uh, the I think so. I think so. Um, I think that the subarachnoid extension that is included in the um, Edinburgh criteria maps well with siderosis uh, in the Boson criteria. So yeah. patients who have subarachnoid extension are more likely to have siderosis if you do the MRI. So that's a very good marker. Yeah. Finger-like projections, I'm not sure what they would map to uh, other than a larger hematoma volume and more of an avalanche effect as the hemorrhage expands. So definitely there is a role of a CT markers, but the role, its role is more restricted by definition. Yeah. Um, so, so, so going back to, to the uh, lower MRS, the criteria said that strictly strictly lower ICH. Uh, what is strictly lower? Do, do you have less than one centimeter, um, or uh, adjacent to the cortex? Of yeah. what if, if it's get to the centrum semiovale? Yeah, that, that, that's another amazing question. It, basically, what you're alluding to is that the Boston criteria seem simple, but a pre-requirement is to be able to rate all the constituting elements, right? Yeah. So what is a lower hemorrhage? Um, in the study, we have used a, a, an anatomic classification scale for hemorrhage, which is called CHARTS. Right. It's a scale that... Uh, um, we developed uh, at University College London just because it's not straightforward to classify hemorrhage. So lower hemorrhage definitely excludes hemorrhages that are clearly deep. So hemorrhages in the basal ganglia, thalami, 
brainstem, by definition, are not lower. Then for the rest of the brain, there is no strict size criterion or distance criterion. So a hemorrhage might be very, very cortical within the cortex, or it might extend to the centrum semiovale. It will still count as lobar. Um, okay. The problem is that sometimes you have really big hemorrhages that they touch on both the cortex and the superficial. Yeah, you don't know where it starts. Some yeah, deep... you don't know where it starts. Yeah. Yeah. So those cases are very challenging. I, I don't have a good answer. Sometimes you can use the presumed epicenter of the bleed yeah. to see where that is located with the assumption that the expansion happens around the epicenter, although that might not be true in, uh, in a lot of cases. Uh, so yeah, it's something to take into account uh, when you approach these patients. That's why you need to be open-minded. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Andreas. And, uh... We we are going to uh, to the end, so uh, I would like to ask you, what do you think or what do you uh, expect that will be the most important contribution uh, from the Boston criteria to bono to neurology? The most okay, <laughs> it's a uh, I guess only time will show, but my suspicion is that um, the new Boston criteria by including all the changes we discussed, they open up this, they, re, they make neurologists realize that amyloid angiopathy is a spectrum. It's a huge spectrum of different imaging markers, not necessarily hemorrhagic, Understood. different presentations. So I think they might, um, uh, they might make people more vigilant to suspect and diagnose CAA. So it might lead to better diagnosis of amyloid angiopathy. And um, it might also lead because these criteria are essentially designed for both research and clinical practice. And on purpose, we aim to have a common set of criteria, uh, which now with the expansion we did, I think it opens up exciting prospects for research and clinical trials by potentially including patients with slightly different phenotypes on imaging that were uh, uh, used to compare to the past. So I, I think it will aid the clinical diagnosis, but will also help with research and expand our net of uh, patients that we can potentially suspect they had CA, include them in, in, in uh, trials, in observational studies, and then learn more on how to fine tune a lot of the uh, clinical aspects uh, and the clinical dilemmas that come with CA. So I think that could be the best um, uh, contribution or the contribution I, I envision uh, for the Boston criteria. Well, can I reverse the question? What do you think is... Uh, I, I think that's a, it's a, uh, as I said to you at the, uh, at the start, it's like a, a mind opening criteria is what you said it's not just bleed you have to look for another things and and i think that we will have to to change or make a, a new template when you go to check every of the features uh including these non-hemorrhagic ones that uh i i um personally i overlook a lot um after i i, I learn more about caa so I yeah. think that in, in, in practical, uh, it's going to 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 change that the, the way that we um, that we uh, look for these features and we interpret uh, the imaging, especially MR, MRI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in, because uh, the the patient that uh, came with uh, an ICH is kind of different of. Uh, from the patient that came with uh, TFNEs, okay. Yeah. So uh, the patient comes with uh, this this uh, mainly positive symptoms uh, with the march, and and you think ah, this is our TFNE, uh, and what are you going to look uh, for first? The 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 cortical uh, superficial sclerosis, but yeah. you now you you know now that you it's not the only feature that you uh, must go to look for it. 
on the yeah. MRI. So you are going to look for um, for uh, white matter hyperintensity. You are going to to look for this this uh, enlarged uh, uh, perivascular space. So uh, I think it's going to be pr a practice uh, changer. Yeah. 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 And Thank you do you for think... giving us more job? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do, do you think that the, the white matter features are um, are easy to rate based on, on your experience, or people are becoming more familiar with assessing perivascular spaces and the different patterns of white matter fiber intensities? Or do you think I, it's complicated? I, I think that I think that we we uh, we are most um, used to look for it, but uh, honestly, I don't know uh, still if we are going to be good on counting the the white matter hyperintensities. Um, yeah. I, I think that we should uh, make maybe uh, local studies uh to see what is the uh, interrated uh reliability yeah these kind of features what what was the 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 in, the interrated agreement in, in its study so the the cup values if i remember well it, it was above a above 0 0.8 uh, for okay. both prevascular spaces and the white matter spots um again it, it depends on, on the rater's experience how many scans yeah that they have seen. So one idea would be to put together some sort of um, uh, rating scale or a collection of images uh, that would qualify as uh, uh, one point in the Boston criteria. So people are yeah. familiar and they can fine tune themselves uh, for rating so that you don't overcount or undercount. Yeah. Um, the idea, of course, why we have picked up this specific cutoffs is that when they're present, they're, you can assess them visually in that the pattern is there. Most of the time, you don't even have to count because there are so many spots or so many yeah. PBS. Uh, so yeah. it's more like a, a gestalt approach, but there are intermediate cases, right? That it can go either way. Yeah, yeah. intermediate cases. It, it happens with stroke, uh, with the, the aspect score. Yeah. Uh, we, we don't care if it is a, a nine ten, but if it, if it is five, if it is six, uh, if, yeah. if you are strictly uh, uh, follow the the, the guidelines, uh, but uh, we will expect that uh, the, the the international uh, group uh, create some kind of um, of uh, a teaching uh, website. What do you think about that? Yeah, it's something that we thought about it to creating some sort of um, online uh, short course um, so that people are familiar and we're all on the same page on what is a micron bleed, what is uh, what are white matter spots, uh, what are the all the nuances that you need to take into account so that people can use it as a as a template for their own ratings. So it's something I believe we should do. Uh, our only restriction was time because we wanted to obviously get this uh, study out first, but it's something that we, I think we should work on with the, uh, the, the stroke community. and the, With the World Stroke Academy. <laughs> yeah, the World Stroke Academy would be a great idea Yeah, to put that together. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Andreas. It has been a wonderful interview. Uh, again, it's my pleasure. Uh, to to be here with you thanks again a lot for all the teaching uh that you have been doing on on, on twitter and obviously uh, uh, on your research um uh, uh, for every everyone on the team on the um, the centers that are uh, pushing the knowledge of of caa further and further thank you thank you very much. No, thank you so much yeah. for the uh, for this amazing talk. I, I certainly learned and made me thought of of many things uh, by talking with you. And uh, th these sort of studies and this study wouldn't have been possible without uh, the international SA community. That they all it was basically a team effort. They all generously contributed data. They contributed time. Uh, 
intellectual um, input. And uh, I think it goes to show what we can achieve when we all work together as a community, because this study wouldn't have been possible. Just the sheer numbers were not there for any single center to do. So I think that's a way forth. And it's it has been the way forth for stroke, especially right in the last few years, all of these game changing trials for all international efforts. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so everyone uh, for being here. Um, I hope you enjoy as much as me this interview with Andreas Charidimu about the Boston, uh, the new Boston criteria recently published on uh, Lancet. Uh, you can follow on, on Twitter. Andreas, give you your account. Yeah, uh, we're going to have it as well at the end, but my account is uh, A underscore Haridimu, and uh, I aim to uh, post their uh, images that uh, I believe they elucidate concepts around CAA, uh, as well as all of these nuances we discuss about the MRI features. So uh, feel free to follow and uh, comment on, give input on the content. Thank you. You can follow us on Wallstroke at and uh, you can visit our website, worldstrokeacademy.com. Thank you very much. See you next. Good night. Thank you.